This video has the first part of the lecture recordings for this week and um, it's focusing on, we're going to focus on the article or chapter by Raymond de Ruber. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to summarise what he said. This is not the equivalent of the summaries that I hope that you've all prepared. I do understand it's a very long document. And there are things about it that are not immediately apparent. And I'm going to really go into them and do so critically so that you can see how that can be done. Not just with this, but with anything, just by looking at what is known about the context, about everything relating to what you're reading or looking at. Raymond de Ruber was a very influential person in this literature that we are looking at, the literature of the history of accounting. There were two major researchers in accounting history in the 20th century who wrote in English and he was the first and probably the most influential. The other was Basil Yami who will come to later in the course. Raymond Ruber started in the mid 1930s Basil Yami started in the 1940s and their interests were different but not so different that they didn't overlap a lot. And what De Rover wrote was to some extent responsible for some of the thinking that Yami developed. If you look at De Rover's uh, first few words, this is from the first page where he's defining double entry and he says that you have to define it according to these criteria otherwise it's not there. So firstly you have to have duality which is that everything's recorded twice, once on the debit and once on the credit. But he goes on to say it also involves the existence of an integrated system of accounts both real and nominal. Real accounts are what goes in the balance sheet nominal accounts of what goes in the income statement. And the existence of that integrated system enables the account books to balance in the end and enables the changes known as equity to be presented or determined, i.e. whether or not they made a profit or a loss. So that's him putting it down in print. Now that had already been put down in print by several others before him. Italians and when he did it it basically made that what everyone had to do because he was widely read and he was very influential both for the people speaking English interested in accounting history and for those speaking other languages and this set a tone if he on the other hand had just said it requires duality the history of accounting from the 1950s onwards being very different because people would have opened their minds but this definition closes minds. He went on to say often medieval balance sheets did not balance, errors not traced, written off to profit and loss and double entry bookkeeping developed simultaneously in several Italian towns. On the first one the balance sheet did not balance and the second he was relying on what he knew from what he'd seen in the archives and he spent a lot of time looking at the archives of the Dartini firm which was from the second half of the 14th century to the end of the first decade of the 15th so it was 
from about 1364 to 1410. He also looked at some others, but he also looked at what other people had written, and you see that in his citations, which are placed at the bottom of the page's footnotes as you go through it. He relied a lot on Federico Mellis, Federico Mellis, the was Italian, leading Italian, a business historian of the mid 20th century, who, if you like, was in charge of the Dittini archive. And he did restrict other people going into it. So de Ruber was very fortunate to get the access that he had. And he's lifted the second point from that archive. And he actually makes a reference to it further on in the chapter about um, what was done in the, when the mistakes were found. Now, the first one is correct. They often did not balance. If they were balanced, they often did not balance properly. In other words, the debits did not equal the credits. Richard Goldthwaite, who's an economic historian who has been working in uh, the archives in Florence and Tuscany since the 1970s and is still doing it, has never found a perfectly recorded ledger. And he's looked at hundreds, if not thousands. The error is not traced. That's not correct. And the material that... Um, Deruva presents in this chapter demonstrates it's not correct. So he was simplifying it, what he felt, and making it very simple here by overstating it. If they couldn't be traced, they were written off. But what happened then was that the bookkeepers, over the next period, tried to find the errors. And some of them were found before what happened next occurred which is something we'll come to later, uh, particularly in the case of the Dattini firm, because as Deruber tells you, they had to prepare annual reports to send to head office, and those reports were the list of balances. And they tried to find the errors before they prepared the reports, or certainly before they sent them off. Double entry bookkeeping developed simultaneously in several Italian towns in the third one. You can see that because there's double entry in all the major trading centres in northern Italy. So that came from all the knowledge he had of various places, plus his reading that he'd done under that point. So he says, taking that forward, it did not grow out of some of the pre-established theories. So no one thought about doing it and then said, OK, we should do it this way, let's do it. And none of that happened. The second statement there is quite a big exaggeration. Improvements were made because a bookkeeper got better at doing the job. They were made not in accounting terms, so the improvement wasn't, for example, inventing uh, a way of putting aside some of the profit into a reserve. That was not an improvement. Improvement was where the technique got better. And you can see, in even in the archive, that he is focusing on it, the first half of this article, the one in, the, the teeny one, you can see when the bookkeeper changes that the, the methods got worse. And in, some, in one particular case, it, the bookkeeping completely disintegrated. Um, and it's extremely difficult to work out what the debits and the credits are. So it wasn't continuous improvement, and it wasn't just improvements that were made. It was just the system developed. The system in use in 1400 in a particular firm might have been much less useful than it was than the system that was in use in 1395. And the system in use in 1405 must have, might have been much worse as well. But as the system matured, and that's a better way of putting it, and a standardisation of the approach was adopted by firms, 
in the 15th century. Maybe it did start to um, spread a bit more. But a lot more things going on in the background. You had all these fairs going on and the, the, the merchant bankers who ran the clearing at the fairs, they clearly learnt from each other. And that is really where there was a standardisation. Also in the, the local banks, they had to uh, do book transfers, not just between their own customers, but between a customer in their bank and a customer of another bank. So the, clearly the banks had to get together and they could see how each other was doing it. So it standardised that way. So that's really where the standardisation came from. And the counting house, they just mean the headquarters of the business, wherever the business is based. And he talks about the three factors that, that um, contributed most to the progress of accounting. And here you've got to be very careful what, what he's talking about. Um, it's really more about bookkeeping he's dealing with. Um, you had credit and you had agency and you had partnership. And he says that partnerships perhaps the most important since it led to the recognition of firm as an entity distinct from its owners. That might be true in a modern sense. But that didn't progress to the development of double entry in this, the way he intended. What it did do was in Tuscany, it resulted in the firms closing the ledgers to calculate the profits so that they could hand it out to each of the partners. So partnership was the reason that you got the first attempts to calculate the profit of a business. Merchants working on their own didn't need to calculate their profits. They weren't reporting to anyone. All they wanted to do was keep making a profit. So to them, the amount they were making in total didn't matter. And in fact, the Dettini firm that Druver focuses on, the one that's in Tuscany, in Prato, which is near Florence, although all, the, all of the branches were submitting annual reports listing their debtors and their creditors, these were never used in any form by Zatini himself to calculate his overall profit. Never. So this is not quite what he's saying there is looking at it mainly through modern eyes rather than through the eyes of that time. And he goes on to say the partnerships are pretty loose to begin with and they were focused on voyage as well. There would have been some that have been focused on voyages, but others would have been focused on other things. And it's he's really talking about formal partnerships, where you, you go in those, he's referring to ones that have been done in Genu Genoa, where you'd go to a, a notary and get a contract uh, drawn up, the sort of thing we covered last week in the in the course. What his thing says is that things began to change and thing, these arrangements became more durable, more consistent, more widespread. They became more widespread in, in Florence, in Tuscany. Other parts of Italy didn't have the same systems, the same type of businesses. Immediate results make the medieval bookkeeper conscious of the fact the firm is a unit and the capital and community to profit represents the claim of the owner. No. A bookkeeper was simply trying to keep a record of what happened. The third one is Deruber being unable to explain why the bookkeeper kept his books, why accounts were kept. So he's using a modern lens to, to give an explanation. And anyway, the bookkeepers were mainly the merchants. Not very many employed separate bookkeepers. You had to be either very wealthy or a, a very good size of business. The changes in the owner's equity talks about keeping an eye on all the rest of it. Yeah, that's true if you have to distribute profit. But very, very few firms had partnerships where that was the case. And they were 
from what we know, they were Tuscan, Florentine, essentially. But very few were. In most cases, this didn't matter. And equity was just the owner's own account. And it had the owner's name in it. It, it wasn't necessarily labelled um, capital and there wasn't a section of accounts under the label of equity or even an equity account. Finally, number five, as early as the 14th century, larger Italian merchants um, and, and bankers, the companies, set aside reserves. Well, again, he's referring to Dottini because that's where he specialised at that point. If he talked about the 15th century, he'd be talking about Medici, which he does towards later on in the chapter. And the Medici are the role model for how to do double entry in medieval Italy. They are looked on as being the pinnacle of how far it had developed by the end of the 15th century. Talks a bit about credit at that point. And he he's appreciates the importance of the, the Crusades in expanding trade. He talks about the inadequacy of using other ways to record credit. A tally was a stick that you marked and then you broke, gave one part to your debtor and you kept the other and vice versa. And that was your evidence of the debt. When you, the debt was settled, you handed it back. The written records were, first of all, in paragraph form, uh, and it's described there, and you saw it in the invention of double entry bookkeeping article. The appropriate formula is referring to the sequencing and also the location as it was in the in the books that were kept. When he says there were no accounts current and each transaction was considered separately, you got to remember, firstly, he was Belgian and English was his second language. And he, at this point, 56, he'd been less than 20 years in the in America. So occasionally he say things or write things that are ambiguous. No accounts current. He's really talking about, I believe, two things. One, he could be referring to partnership, partners, capital accounts being the current account and the capital account. So he's referring to a current account where all the profits are put in and the capital's permanent. Or he's just referring to the accounts being um, containing both the debit and the credit in one place. But I think that's, that's the second point. So I think the first one is he's referring to the current account for a partner. It was only gradually that all items concerning the same person were um, put together so that you could see where the person, that individual stood. To an extent that's true. You certainly had the de debits recorded in a different place from the credits. In theory, but in practice when you've got mingled accounts of the type, the paragraph type and someone's only got one account then you've got every bit of information you need to work out the balance. He talks about the, the shift to um, to a bilateral format where the debits and the credits are on our opposite pages. So that's him giving you the background. When he wrote this, the English language historians of accounting did not know this. So this is all new to them. He says the paragraph form is found in the Florentine account book from 1211. And that each loan is still considered as a separate transaction. So he's saying up to that point, Nothing had changed. They'd, they'd become more advanced in their bookkeeping, but they still did not distinguish clearly what an individual owed or was owed because every transaction was put in a different place. Now, you remember back to when you looked at that paper on the invention of double entry bookkeeping at the Florentine account book and the examples the second account in the exhibit 
doesn't treat each loan as a separate transaction. The first entry for eight soldi was a loan. The second entry for 35 soldi, four denarii, was a loan. And Ruva was claiming that he'd looked at this closely. Well, he'd missed that. We all make mistakes. But it's more likely that he had looked at it, but hadn't studied it very closely. And at that point, there were no English translations of it. And his first language is French. And the transcriptions were in medieval Italian. In many cases, the text mentions not only the debtor, but also gives the name of two witnesses. This is still talking about 1211, which, and this is correct. Now, you remember from last week that the, the historians of law had said that the, because it's written in the vernacular, the language of the day, the account book has a legal um, validity. And what is written in the invention paper was by me was that the um, the names of witnesses were put into the entries as a signpost of where evidence lay and it was with the witnesses or maybe in written statements that they'd done they prepared in case of a dispute it's all linked to the law and yet he takes that same information and says does this mean that the account book wasn't acceptable as evidence in courts of law? And he knew that it was under Roman law. So this is a very strange statement. And I think what he was doing there was simply asking the question, and a rhetorical question, in the hope that someone would, would uh, write something about it somewhere. I'm pretty sure he knew what, he was, what, what, what it was, and it wasn't what he says there. He must have known that all the evidence suggests that they were recognised. He talks about agency. He says it's less important than the other two. He talks in the influence of development accounting. And the development of bookkeeping agency is very, very important. And no less important than partners because partners who are not present are agents of the other partners. So that's that's a strange one. But he then says, but that might explain the appearance of merchandise accounts, which is just not a valid um, point to make. He then goes on to talk about venture accounts, venturing, going on voyages, sending goods on consignment, doing something as a one-off. They were all ventures. And we have a form of bookkeeping called venture venture accounting. Um, and there's even an international accounting standard on accounting for ventures. Well, back in those days, venturing was what businesses did. If you were going to do some business at the Champagne Fair, the merchant would set off from Italy with goods. Uh, and the venture was his trip to the fair. And then he'd come back and he'd sell it all up. Inventory evaluation, he says, did not, did not constitute a problem. Well, it constituted an enormous problem because it prevented anyone calculating profit. It wasn't a problem for the merchants. It wasn't a problem at all. But it meant that when the accounting historians of the 20th century looked at the account books in search of... Um, a list of balances that was would comply with how we would do it today. They they found the inventory valued at very strange amounts, and no adjustments made nothing, because you couldn't you didn't know what the inventory was valued if it was four hundred five hundred a thousand miles away. Medieval merchants were accustomed to open a separate account for each lot of consignment. If they did, everything they bought, every batch they bought, went to its own account. And they put all the revenues for the sale of that those items in a batch into that same account. So you could easily end up with a credit balance because obviously you sell things normally at a higher 
price than you buy them for. He mentions as an example of that later on in the chapter, uh, talking about charges that have been made against other people that have been credits in the inventory account. But that wasn't the reason. It was the money coming in from the sales that gave it a credit balance when there were still goods in, in inventory. So even the inventory that you had it at your base, which which was visible to you, which you could count, the account book, if you did a balance on the account for that inventory, could easily show a value that was higher than the original cost of the goods that were left. So putting those, those, that little point, those little points together, it was difficult to prepare an income statement to our standards because of that. And so when merchants had to prepare one because they were in a partnership, they cut corners. They all agreed to do it by whatever process they, they had agreed and, and that was it. And they divided up everything so that everything ended up as fair as possible. In dealing with the medieval bookkeeping, one must not lose sight of the prevailing ways of doing business. Raymond de River loses sight of it all the time. Uh, he keeps slipping into using a modern pair of glasses instead of one that's con contemporary or con is relevant to the time that he's looking at. But the point he's making is very important. Now, a couple of years later, he wrote an article in which he confessed he could not understand why the bookkeepers of that period did what they did. So he, he wanted to keep, in it, keep pay attention to the way they were doing business, but he couldn't connect the ways they were doing business with what he was seeing because it was so alien to him. So when you're reading what he's writing in this chapter, you've got to bear in mind that he's doing his best but his thoughts are getting in, impacted by his knowledge of what happened in the 20th century. goes on to say, we should not assume that balancing the books is the primary objective of medieval accounting. He's absolutely right. But very few accounting historians who read that chapter paid any attention to that statement. He then says, number two, the merchants in Italy had begun by 1400 to use accounting as a tool of management or control, which they did. And they were controlling debt and they were controlling the agents. They were controlling the partners they couldn't see and the managers they couldn't see. And it was all happening. You could see it if you look very closely in the Dettini firm that he was focusing on in the first half of this chapter. They were not so advanced as they are today. And quite a distance from realising a potential double entry bookkeeping, which is true. They hadn't quite worked out what you can get from the system. They hadn't really worked out the benefits of having a trial balance. Never mind the potential benefits of having a, a bit of knowledge about financial position and so on. Not that that was really important to them at the time, it wasn't, unless you were a partner. They made a start by developing the rudiments of cost accounting, they did, and it was quite sophisticated cost accounting, and compares very well with cost accounting several centuries later. They introduced reserves. Uh, yes, they did. But they were more like... Um, they were more like what we would do, they were accrued expenses. Uh, there was reserves for salary in the Dettini books. He talks about it in, in his chapter. It is called reservo in the entry, but it's what we would call an accrual. And he talks about, mentions accruals as well and deferred items. He's, he's talking about the same things and just giving them different labels all at once. Giving attention to the audit of balance sheets. Now, what he's talking about there is not that, that anyone was writing books on how to do an audit or how or people were telling each other how they should be doing it. He can see examples in the archives, in the account books, and in the reports from Dettini's branches that some form of auditing was taking place. So he's taking an example from... It's actually from 1399 in Barcelona, where he, he could see 
an audit going on because of the the, the calculations have been done and you will be coming to them in a few minutes and he generalized that and said well you know people are really starting to get into it they're really starting to do this it's cost accounting comes from Dottini as well he's giving the impression that these things were developing all over the place they weren't they were very specific to the, a few firms only in the analysis of financial statements did merchants of that time make little progress in other words they weren't bothered about doing financial statements is that making progress or not making progress well, it goes back to what he said. You need to know what businesses were doing at the time. And they didn't want to prepare financial statements. They had no need for them. So you can't criticise them for making no progress because they didn't have a need to make the progress. And that's something that were never understood. He then goes on to talk about Castellani. Uh, Castellani, uh, was a two-volume book. It's very, very long with all he transcribed all of the um, account books he could find and documents he could find from before 1300 in Florence he transcribed them it's an incredibly useful book for anyone interested in medieval accounting history in some cases he went beyond transcribing it and discussed it as well and Raymond de Ruva was one of the advisors of Castellani. Castellani was an expert in handwriting. So he, de Ruva would have given him advice on accounting. And what Castellani, who did not have the baggage of using a modern definition of, of 20th century definition of double entry, as declared by accounting historians. He looked for duality, the debit and the credit. And Castellani said, it's double entry. Well, you know from the diffusion that he was right, because that's what even de Ruver came to say in 1963. But in 1956, de Ruver was very doubtful because he was still locked into the definition at the beginning of the chapter. He was still looking for evidence of movements in capital, of um, effectively a balance sheet. And he talks about being a small fragment. Finney is not that small. And he emphasises the procedure used in closing the books. In other words, he's not going to accept his double entry unless they close their books. By 63, seven years later, he had changed his mind. He didn't need them anymore. Do we have a real balance showing the assets on one side and liabilities doing as equity on the other? Well, he's not going to get that at a point in time when bilateral format was not in use. So he's actually bringing in yet another requirement, one that some of the other accounting historians of that period were using, and saying you can't have paragraph accounts and have a double entry. They must be bilateral debits on one side, credits on the other. So he was getting himself very tightly um, transfixed with the definition of double entry that he and the other accounting historians were using. And as he went through the article, and this is only the first five pages of it, he goes from being quite laid back about how he's, he has a definition of it's, it's basically, basically saying you must do all this. And as you get to page 119, he's beginning to show a few doubts. But then he just jumps back in and says, no, 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 you must stick to that definition. And as I say, seven years later, he'd relaxed everything and gone back. Now, this section then appears, which is one long statement. And there's not a great necessity to dwell on it too much for now. But this is just what it looks like in the text. Now, what I've done is I put it onto another sheet picking out the key things. He says, for off he might be another example of double entry because everything has cross-references, which implies that everything is, is dualities there, but also cross-references. He says that they're not present in the case of cash because they had a separate cash book. 
And if you think about cash, when a merchant received cash, a merchant had to have it a seed. He'd go to a money changer and convert the cash into a value that he would either get given to him in gold or silver coins, so it was the correct value, or it would be put into a bank account. But the actual cash you received might be different in value from what actually goes into the account book. So it would not be inappropriate for there to be no record in a cash book with only entries in a separate account and the entries made by um, when you go to the after you get the money exchanged. On the other hand, you can do your double entry. Um, let's say you receive cash for some goods you've sold. You debit the cash, credit the, the goods. Um, the, the cash would say, say, let's say, say it showed 10 florins. And you go, you then go to the, the money changer and you get it converted and the money changer gives you the equivalent of nine florins. Let's say nine florins. So you then make a, a credit entry in your cash book of one florin because that's the loss you made and you make a debit entry on exchange in the account for losses on exchange. And that's example that I've just given you. It says that even though cash value cash was unreliable, it had to be controlled just as debt had to be controlled. So you had to keep a record of it. So they would have had a separate cash book, maybe a notebook just for recording the receipts. And in Tuscany, uh, it was called uh, Entrata e Usita, Incomings and Outgoings. It had the equivalent state, it had the equivalent status of a cash book. And the cash book, um, today we think of, when we talk about a cash book, we're really thinking about a cash account, um, just with a lot of extra detail in it. And the balance on the cash book would be put into the trial balance and you wouldn't have a cash account in the, the ledger. The merchandise accounts kept in the Libra Rosso or Red Book, that is Detini. There was no uniform. If people had an account for merchandise, which was your inventory, and they kept all the, the merchandise accounts together, in one place, not the ledger. The book that it was in would be called the merchandise book. It could have been red, green, blue, white, black, any colour. But the example that that Turuva saw was red, so he told, he, he said basically, or he, the way he put it, everyone used the red book. They didn't. And quite often merchandise accounts were in the ledger anyway. Of course, sectioning ledger is perfectly compatible with double entry. It's even indicative of better organisation since it permits dividing uh, the work among several bookkeepers. And he sees that as a good thing. Well, it wasn't. It was disastrous because the bookkeepers were at different levels, different standards. And typically, even the biggest firms would only have one. The people that kept the books were the partners, the owners or the owner. And if they had a bookkeeper, it was a bookkeeper. He didn't divide it up the ledger so that lots of different people made entries in it. And apart from that, when you registered your book in those places where that was necessary, if they were to have legal status, the handwriting was noted. So here's his modern head where if you divide things up in a business, you prevent fraud. So you do the ledger, it permits you to divide things up between the bookkeepers and he's linking the, the fraud prevention to the bookkeeping. And that's a modern th way of thinking. Didn't apply in those at that period. He then jumps, jumps a little bit, or I jumped a bit. 
talking about single entry uh, in a set of account books, not very interesting, he says. And he says you get the same three things in a bank in the late 14th century. And Tomasa Zerbi, who was a specialist on um, medieval bookkeeping in Milan, wrote a very long book in it, published just a couple of years, a few years before Derover's. Zerbi, who, had, who was, as I say, was a specialist in that area, in that period, said the books, the bank originally kept his book in double entry, but the system broke down because of monetary disorders. That's what Zerbi said. And that as a result, it became increasingly impractical to keep accounts in one monetary unit when business was actually, tra actually transacted in two or three rival currencies. Think back to what you read about monies of account. This is per completely irrelevant to bookkeeping in double entry because none of the entries are actually real money. They are monies of account. So even if you had half a dozen different currencies, the entry in your double entry ledger would only be in one currency. So this is fiction. The whole issue about monies of account became much more better known around about the same year as Deruba wrote this. Um, and it's possible that he wasn't aware of it yet at that time. His point five is just nonsense. The transition between single to double entry in Tuscany best study in the records of Francesco de Marco de Tini, and it undoubtedly is. It's the most fantastic uh, set of account books covering um, almost 30 years that you can see the bookkeeper getting better. You can see the switch and how this, the double entry system matured. The merchandise accounts were moved out into separate ledger which meant you could take a balance from there and just put the balance in somewhere. And all sorts of adjustments were done to make it better. So these are looked on, the, the, the teeny records are looked on as the perfect example if you want to know how bookkeepers develop their practices to arrive at something close to how we would expect double entry to be done. You get a branch manager expect to send regularly a copy of the balance sheet headquarters. And he uses the term balance sheet there. He later on tries to avoid using it. But it's too late, he's done it. And that had implications for what uh, people did with what he wrote. He refers again to the small errors which they often didn't bother to trace, point to made in an earlier slide. And they just adjusted it to profit and loss. And he then says, I'm going to give you tables two and three, the balance sheet and income statement. And he uses the term income statement. January 31st, 1399. These tables show behind any doubt the books were kept according to the most exacting standards of double entry. Now, if you're gonna if you're gonna read something and then say to yourself, well, does it make sense? Is it logical? He gave you a, he gave you a definition of how he sees double entry at the beginning. So you have to have the ability you have to have books that can balance, and you have to have the ability to uh, show movements in the the capital of the owners. So he's saying that because we can make a balance sheet and income statement from those records. They were definitely in double entry. And yet he doesn't bother with anything about um, cross-referencing indication of the contract account, um, ensuring dualities all over the place. 
it's a bit of a step to say that we what he said there however it gets worse he says table two is not a reconstruction but a condensed balance sheet based on an original that's an original balance sheet of which there are two different copies of the Tini archives there are two copies one was kept at the branch and the other was sent off to the branch's um, regional head in Mallorca and they are they contain the same information one ends when the last of the balances is written into it and this other one which is the, the version that was kept locally um, does not it has it has uh, adjustments as you'll see in a minute it makes a good point if you publish in its original form take too much space and serve no useful purpose well actually it must have served a useful purpose because it was sent to the head office and that purpose was to control credit to know what position the debt position of a branch was was important it was important so that you could know whether or not the branch was keeping a control over its liabilities it was that um, it was important so you know if the branch managers were controlling debt effectively how old was the debt for example was it from the previous year because you see the same people growing balances it was extremely useful per document it served a very big and important purpose and the other main thing it did is it enabled the head office to know where the money was so that if it needed to to send funds somewhere it could contact that office and say send the funds from your place to London for example very important very useful it didn't have to be a balance sheet an income statement to do that so he says he's taken the original balance sheets and he's grouped them and this is a condensed version this is called in uh, the terms we use in accounting this is called a synthetic balance sheet it's it's a, the equivalent of what we get today all like things are grouped together and you know the two halves of the balance sheet balance so you have the same balancing figure of 15,208.15-4 down at the bottom the very bottom you have the owner's equity um, and we'll come back to that later but that's the balance sheet that he produced now we'll show you what that really looked like so this is the first page of the cover sheet um, just saying what it is it's the the book of balances gives the date 31st of January 1398 and it's interesting in itself because in those years that time the beginning of the year was in March so that was January 1398 the month before it was December of 1398 the month after it was February of 1398 the month after that was March of 1399. What Deruber did was he just called that 1399 using a modern calendar. The symbol with the F, that's Tatini's personal symbol for his, that he used on his business, throughout his business. And this is the first page of balances. And what he did was he had the the debits at the front and credits at the end. So you got the debits and they go down on the second page, they're going down both columns, the left hand column and the right hand column. And you'll see later when we get to the credits, when we get to the end of them, 
So this is maintained, you're always just going down one page, then another page, and these are balances of all of accounts with the same type of balance. You notice there's a total at the bottom of each of the pages, which helps with the adding up the whole thing. So we're still carrying on with this. And on the next page, those are finished. The debits have finished, and now the creditors, creditori. And then you go down to the next couple of pages. So there's a lot less credit balances and debit balances. That's the first point. And then down at the bottom of the right-hand page, from about halfway down, you start to get these uh, calculations to see where, there, where, the, where the errors might have been taking place. The, to, the total of both sides are compared, uh, 15198 and 15097. And then an attempt is made to, to identify what the difference is. And there's uh, some notes on the, on the last page. Well, that's the report that was sent. Um, it's not a balance sheet. It's just a list of balances. The, the closest it would be to present day would be a trial balance. They didn't know the concept. But as you can see in this case, with the adjustments at the bottom, the calculations at the bottom, they knew that if you were careful with it, you could get yourself enough information to discover what might have gone wrong and to identify mistakes. Um, that's it. This is the adjustments that was made to that report at the very end. On the left, you can see numbers that are similar to those that you've seen already in the balance sheet. You see there in the middle of the screen, 15198154. And you can see it typed in the, on the right. You can see it handwritten on the left. So the one on the right is a transcription that's been translated into English. So you can see what everything on the left actually means. So the sum of all the creditors, according to the the list of the balances that you've just seen was 15198154. Debtors was 15097. So it's about 101 difference. 1091. And then below it, you see some adjustments that they could make. So they found 100 and they found 10. And they were looking for an explanation for the, for the mistakes, for the differences. And that is the example I was saying you, you see of an audit. So basically the, the bookkeeper, and it was the bookkeeper, um, went through the ledger and the other sources for the entries in the list of balances and checked all the double entries, discovered that um, Commissions have been missed out. Half we down, we put for commissions at Carta 297, 10, 5, and 4. And you know, these, these, these adjustments were done. So, this was the bookkeeper trying to correct the mistakes in the ledger. He didn't just write it all off. He had to because if the business lost money because the mistake was in the wrong direction, the bookkeeper had to pay for it. So it was in the bookkeeper's best interest to go and find out. This is the what he'd referred to as an income statement, a statement of profit and loss, two terms for the same thing. And we get the amounts for the gross profit, The total expenses and the total income. Now remember that the amounts, uh, there is always a, a link between an income statement and a balance sheet. 
and sure enough, you can see it. Forget it, you arrive at for the overall profit. There's the owner's equity for um, the teeny, the profit adjustment, and you get the figure that appears in the income statement. So we managed to create these two documents. They're historically inappropriate, but they made it easy for a person from the 20th century to understand what was going on. And that was his whole point. He wanted people to be able to understand. Unfortunately, those that have read this chapter, and bear in mind how long it is, they read the chapter and they seem to have managed to not notice that he said he had taken the original and compressed it or condensed it. And actually, if they read what he said, they would still think that the original was a balance sheet, but not one with everything of the same type being joined together. So instead of having one figure for one thing, there would maybe be 12 numbers in the original. He just added them all together to get one. No. So the assumption in, that seems to be evident in the account history literature after this is that Dettini prepared balance sheets and income statements and that therefore all merchants in Italy did because there's a lot of generalisation going on in that literature and it's totally wrong. That report is the closest you get to a financial statement for that period and the partnerships who split up their profit or their capital if you like at the end of the partnership's existence or in the middle when they divided the profit they just worked off one of those and that was it there was no special document drawn up or called a balance sheet or an income statement and right at the very end he makes this statement And it summarises what the accounting history literature thinks about this period and double entry. In de Rober's mind, double entry was responding to the needs of capitalism, which really means the, the, the desire to make profit. Businesses were so complex that merchants could not get along with an efficient, without an efficient system of bookkeeping. So the complexity of the organisation meant they had to have efficient books. No. He himself has told you that's not what it was. It was a credit, it was the agents. And he, he separated out the partners, which is really an accounting thing. And we know from previously in this course that it was really the legal system and the credit that led to the bookkeeping in the form it took. And of course the capitalism is still the core because people are only in business to make money and to operate in business they had to deal in credit because there weren't enough coins. So to maintain control they had to have a system of bookkeeping. Now, he didn't know all that because he didn't read as widely as he might have done because, I mean, in those days you couldn't get things on a computer and you didn't, you just couldn't have the wide access we can now. But there were things that had been written by that point that he does use in his work that do tell him or give him enough information to have gone beyond that, but he didn't. He stuck very much with the focus that the other accounting historians of the period had and they tended to ignore the literature in other, from other disciplines. They mentioned it and then ignored it. And then he carries on with it. And a big thing developed slowly and at that point began to gather sort of head of steam, which was whether or not uh, double entry uh, supported the rise of capitalism effectively. And there's quite a big literature about that which we don't really go into in this course. But at the moment, it's quite a hot topic. 
But accountants have still not, accounting historians have still not worked out what the definition is of double entry, if you're going to make that argument um, logical. So when I was, if you were looking at this, you would say, yeah, this is a logical statement at the end, uh, based on what he'd written in the middle, but it doesn't have, it doesn't uh, demonstrate a knowledge of the context, or sufficient knowledge of the context, for the purpose that he wants to put it to. So take that as a supplement to what you've done so far. The rest of the chapter is interesting. It fills out the detail about what was known in the 1950s about the development of, of accounting, of bookkeeping and accounting. And having digested that part or read it, you can move on. The material that he has on, that I've covered here is really the, the material that's truly relevant to what we're doing in this course. But the, art, the article itself, the whole chapter, illustrates um, the way that accounting history literature developed throughout the 20th century with this fixation on a definition for double entry that was about accounting, not about double entry. And that made it very difficult for them to get a true understanding of the history of a double entry and therefore the history of accounting if they'd used appropriate historical methods, we'd have a very different history written by now. <laughs>